Good morning, everyone. I see a lot of people are still coming in, but we can uh, just get started and I can give some quick overview and uh, guidelines for the webinar. Thank you to everyone for joining us and welcome to day two of the Crafting Business Seminar. Uh, hopefully most people would have been able to join us yesterday, but for anyone that's only coming to this morning session, you're very, very welcome. Um, I suppose to start, just to let everyone know that if you did miss yesterday's session, um, or if you aren't able to stay for all of the event this morning, the event is being recorded. We will be adding it to our website and to our social media channels as well, um, which you can find here at Crafting Europe. Um, and you can also see our website is there too. Please do follow us um, on our social media channels on Facebook and Instagram. And you're more than welcome to use the hashtag Crafting Europe as well. And if you'd obviously like any updates on our upcoming open calls and events, you can find all of that information there on craftingeurope.com. So we have a busy schedule for today, um, but before we start, just a few things to note. First of all, if any speak or any participants are joining us from Ukraine, there is the option for translations at the bottom of your screen. Please just click on the little globe icon and you can get um, interpretation into your own language. So hopefully that is useful for everyone. Also, just to say that we will be hosting all of the questions and answers at the end of the event. So if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A section and we will make sure to direct them to the appropriate speakers at the very end of the day. And um, so please just any questions into the Q&A. And uh, finally, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of the project. I know for some people they would have been here yesterday, but for anyone that's just joining us this morning, and isn't familiar with the project. So supported by Creative Europe, the Crafting Europe project was inspired by the need to build capacity within the craft sector across Europe. There are three main activities in the project. The first is crafting business, which you're of course going to hear all about this morning. And we had a wonderful session yesterday. Uh, the second is iAtelier, which is a program of activities designed to encourage innovation by integrating new digital fabrication technologies into the craft practice. It's led by Ireland's Limerick School of Art and Design at the Limerick Institute of Technology, and the activities of iAtelier will take place across all partner countries. The final component is research, which would primarily assess the economic impact of the craft sector in Europe. So the project actually just started in October 2019. Obviously, as everyone is aware, 2020 was a difficult year in terms of COVID and having to put a lot of our activities online. But we're delighted that um, we've been successful in doing that, which you're obviously going to hear about this morning. And the pro project will keep going on till next year. And finally, um, who are we and meeting the partners? I forgot to actually introduce myself at the very beginning. My name is Shauna Sweeney and I work on behalf of Design and Crafts Council in Ireland. Um, and on behalf of myself and all the project partners, we're delighted that you can join us this morning. The Design and Crafts Council Ireland are the lead project partner. And yesterday's event and today's is hosted by the Handicraft Chamber of Ukraine. Other partners include Artex in Italy, who are the communications partner, the Crafts Council UK, Limerick Institute of Technology, CRT in Portugal, EOI Fundus Arte in Spain, the Crafts Council in the Netherlands, and finally, the Georgian Arts and Culture Centre in Georgia. So I hope that's clear. I see there's still a lot of people coming in. So again, just to reiterate, if you have any questions, please put them in to the Q&A. Um, we'll answer all of those at the end. The session is being recorded, so you can find that on our social media channels and our website. And I'm now going to pass it over to our colleague, uh, the president of the Handicraft Chamber of Ukraine, Marina Popovich. Thanks, Marina. Thank you, Shona. Uh, I will switch to Ukrainian language and I restarted. Я приветствую вас, уважаемые коллеги, уважаемые партнеры, участники семинара и, конечно же, дорогие гости. Открывая повестку второго дня нашего международного ивента, хотелось бы еще раз обратить внимание на тот факт, что экономическая суть ремесла, ее социальные причины и факторы развития 
обуславливают органическую необходимость наличия в каждом современном обществе ремесленной институциональной среды. Безусловно, цифровизация, информатизация наряду с гиг-экономикой и другие тренды последних лет радикально меняют ход развития ремесленной деятельности, усиливают рост инноваций в ней, изменяют требования к образованию ремесленников. И креативность ремесленника, плетеная в эту реальность, перерождается, делает его уникальным и устойчивым, укрепляет его экзистенциональное ядро и дает мощный импульс к личной и профессиональной трансформации. Так, наряду с, с развитием современного ремесла происходит культурная, социальная, экономическая и, конечно же, дигитальная эволюция ремесленника. И в этом контексте, дорогие коллеги, образование играет ключевую роль в его будущем. Вчерашний день показал, какая грандиозная работа была проделана странами, участниками в этом контексте. И я уверена, что сегодняшний день будет таким же информационно насыщенным, интересным, полным инсайтов, вдохновляющим нашей организации на продуктивную работу в будущем, в ближайшие годы. Я передаю свое слово. Спасибо. Thank you, Shauna and Marina. A huge amount of work has been done by all partner countries and World Craft Council Europe members. And I am deeply grateful to all our wonderful participants, partners, tutors, Creative Europe, just to everyone who made this event possible. Today is the second day of our unique opportunity to have a virtual trip across eight countries. And now I'm proud to announce our today's headliner. Hello, Rasmus. Rasmus is a managing director at Creative Business Network. So I give the floor to you. Rasmus? Yeah, we can hear you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Now I should be able to share my screen just a second. And there we go. Let me get from the beginning here. So first of all, thank you for the invitation to speak uh, at uh, this uh, conference on um, craftsmanship and creative business. And I will be speaking about the importance of uh, creative business. Uh, I've been working in this field uh, for as long as I can remember. Uh, in the 20, when, well, when I was 18, I, I did um, um, uh, the, the visual identity for a sports competition, a Scandinavian sports competition. And in 20, 2009, I was part of the architecture team that won the master plan for a part of Copenhagen. But most of my life, I've been dedicating to different ways of enabling uh, creative companies to, to grow. And uh, in this sense, not necessarily help H&M, IKEA, and uh, those companies to become even bigger, but uh, to look at how can we infuse uh, entrepreneurial skills and entrepreneurship uh, into the creative sectors, whether that is uh, music, movies, gaming, uh, fashion, uh, craftsmanship, etc. And um, we have done that in, a, in now in what's called Creative Business Network. Creative Business Network is a network of partners from uh, close to 90 countries uh, that all work on how can we uh, help the creatives grow, uh, connect them with investors, connect them with global markets, and also uh, make sure that they can actually uh, unleash the, the innovation capabilities uh, of uh, of both other businesses and also society. So uh, our thesis has very much been uh, that we of course should do what we can do for the creative companies, but we should do it because they have a potential to help other companies and, and society in general to, uh, to find innovative solutions to all the challenges that we're facing. So uh, that has been what we've been working on. Um, we are organized as, um, as a competition. So, uh, we, uh, we, we started in 2012 uh, saying, let's do an entrepreneurship competition. And uh, 17 countries joined us back in 2012. And uh, here in 2021, uh, we are uh, we're 85 countries or so that are all involved in this. Uh, we, uh, we are maybe a bit away from, or all, but still close to 
the 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 craft the, the, the you would say the initial craftsmanship uh, um, uh, sector. Uh, we really are are those we are we are trying to help with the entrepreneurial aspects of of all these different sectors. So we're trying to take a, an entrepreneurial or entrepreneurship view on 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 these on the sectors and also on the creatives uh, and our artists in this field. And uh, because we have discovered that uh, what they need are basically four things. Uh, one is uh, making IP part of their strategy because uh, the, the intellectual property, the immaterial value is higher than in other sectors. In other words, the belt I'm wearing, the value is the logo and the design of the belt, not necessarily the function that it keeps my pants up or the materials, the leather and the metal. So uh, IP is really important. Uh, also, we know that creatives uh, are more internationally oriented in general than the rest of the economy. In other words, if you're working in, in fashion or, or in, in music movies, or even in an obscure language like Danish, uh, TV series uh, can go uh, and travel all around the world uh, if they are able to tap into this universal, uh, these universal universalities that uh, exist, uh, what, what touches us uh, from the, the culture and creative sector. I think that's maybe on a side note, one of the important things of the culture and creative industries is that they are actually quite powerful. We have seen revolutions, we've seen countries being created, we have seen uh, people getting killed because of cartoons, uh, etc. cetera. So uh, I, uh, I see these uh, industries as extremely powerful in many ways, They're infused with uh, symbolic value. Um, so uh, IP and internationalization is, are some of the big things that we look at, uh, helping the, the, the creatives to go abroad through our network. So if you're interested in the Saudi market, if you're interested in the Danish, if you're interested in Nepal, we have uh, partners there that can help with market access. Uh, market access, not just meaning that you want to sell something there, but also that you might want to produce something there. One of the more recent successful Danish ceramics, Anne Black, that I know personally very well, she has uh, most of her uh, ceramics now uh, produced in Vietnam, where she co-owns uh, a factory uh, uh, outside Hanoi for the production of her uh, ceramics, how, how could she could scale herself in that sense. So it's not just about markets in, in that sense, but it could also be production. Uh, um, a third factor for many of the creatives is access to finance. I'm sorry, there's a bit of noise from someone that is slightly distracting. Uh, but there is uh, access to finance, finding investors to grow is also usually difficult. Uh, maybe uh, it varies from sector to sector, whether they have something that's tangible, something that's, um, that you can touch and, 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 and do something with. Uh, but for many of the creatives, uh, it is an idea for something. It is a, it is a, a, a concept that is being uh, created. And uh, that's quite different than owning a hundred cows and going to the bank and asking for money for another hundred cows to produce milk. You know that cows usually produce milk if they're happy. And you also know that people will drink the milk. Uh, more people are drinking soft drinks, unfortunately, but you know that there will be a demand for your product. So in many ways, uh, you could say that uh, uh, also um, uh, that, the, that, that, that the creatives have a disadvantage in finding, getting access to, fi to, to finance. Although many studies show that they are actually more resilient in times of crisis in many ways. There are some studies that, that show that. Then um, I'm just gonna continue here a little bit. Then uh, also what is important with the, with the creatives is uh, business development, developing their business. Part of it could be because uh, creatives are usually in really difficult markets. There is what Richard Caves called the double unknown. One of the economic properties of the, of the creative industries is that uh, the double unknown is that uh, you as creatives, uh, you don't know beforehand exactly what the output will be. It's part of the creation, it's part of the creativity. You don't know the output, the outcome of your uh, creative endeavor, nor do you know the demand necessarily. Uh, Steven Spielberg can have a pretty good idea of what the movie will be like, uh, especially if he uses the same actors, the same uh, cameraman, the same customer, 
you know, the whole, same crew, you could say, of making this movie, but he cannot predict what the, the reception will be, how people will, will uh, what they will think about the movie that he, he makes. And that's the same for all, pretty much all creative sectors, that it is uh, uh, in many ways uh, unpredictable how something will be received. Uh, even for uh, an Italian company like, you could say that is in the creative sector, Ferrari uh, or Ducati, uh, these are, I would say, design companies that sell uh, dreams and stories to people. Uh, even here, they can't know beforehand, uh, before releasing a model, where, whether the reception will be uh, positive uh, or not. They cannot for sure know the, the demand. So this double unknown makes business development uh, the fourth issue uh, difficult for the for the creatives, uh, the, the 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 market uh, uh, aspect. It could also be that uh, it's some, not something that the creatives care about or or have be, have learned anything about because it's not all uh, schools that teach creative skills that also teach business skills. And I would say the jury is also out whether that should take place, whether actually the the the, the, the um, the, the, those that teach creative skills also should teach their business skills. But uh, to sum this up, so business development, access to finance, IPR, and the internationalization are the four uh, uh, obstacles um, facing creatives when they want to grow as such, but also when they want to um, uh, contribute to innovation in other sectors. Um, so we at CBN trying to overcome those by organizing investor readiness uh, seminars. So it's not just about the creators being better at pitching, but also the investors being better at understanding when they see a good idea. Um, who would have thought that Peppa Pig would have been, would be worth 4 billion uh, US dollars, uh, a pig with a younger brother called Gustav here in Denmark at least, uh, then uh, what, what, what made that uh, successful? So uh, we're trying to do all you know, uh, events on this, uh, webinars. We are also uh, holding every year uh, uh, a, a cup, uh, the Creative Business Cup that takes place, that has taken place since 2012. The, the competition is now under the, the umbrella of what we call Bright, because it's more about startups uh, competing. Bright is about uh, uh, highlighting how creative skills can contribute to uh, solutions related to sustainability, uh, mobility, equality, um, or, 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 or public health. Uh, I can encourage all of you to go to the, to the site of the WHO or to our site, uh, uh, Creative Business Network, uh, and see that there is a report out by the WHO, the WHO being very busy with uh, uh, the coronavirus, but actually right before in November, 2019, they published a report of 3,000 cases how creatives can contribute to public health, uh, whether it be uh, Parkinson, dementia, and all kinds of, of, uh, of uh, public health issues. Here, the creatives can play an important part. So, uh, so that is what we're, we're trying to, to do at the Creative Business Network. Uh, we leave those four obstacles so that we actually can see more innovation coming from the creative industries. I can say just in the field of sustainability, uh, I think you, the creatives, have a lot to do because the, we all know from the scientists that what we need to do for creating a more sustainable world, uh, we know that the politicians have more or less understood it uh, with some exceptions here and there. Uh, uh, and now we need those that usually can change behaviors that can get people to get out of their chairs and that's often the, the artists and the creatives, the avant-garde, that can actually change that behaviors. Uh, here, this slide said, talks about the academy. So that's also one of the things that we do. We run uh, learning sessions, uh, usually 30 to 40 hours. Uh, we usually uh, uh, group them, for example, Europeans and Africans or Americas and Asia, et cetera, so that uh, we really can get uh, truly some global connections uh, up and running between uh, the creatives. So uh, we, we have been running uh, several of those since 2012, and it's uh, what we do. We bring in other creatives to, to speak about how they uh, 
encountered uh, obstacles and how they got over those obstacles. And then also how, um, and, and we also get some of the, the jury members, investors, et cetera, to speak about why are they hesitating in investing in, uh, in creative industries and what can be done about it. Um, so, well, these figures here on my slide, you all probably know that it's uh, the creative economy as we see it is uh, both narrowly uh, craft, creative craftsmanship and more broadly the creative industries and even more broader uh, the culture and creative industries uh, where we see this blur between uh, the market and the non-market values, I would say, where uh, a creative product, of course, can have many market values. It can be sold, create jobs, exports, etc. but it can also have some non-market values, uh, non-market values in case of identity, uh, cohesion, uh, understanding, clarity, meaning, all these great things that many of the culture and creative industry sectors can do. It can touch people, it can, it can do stuff if it's, uh, if it's, uh, if it's done uh, well and if you, the creatives, are able to tap into this uh, imaginary river that runs underneath us uh, and connects us all uh, uh, across the globe and also uh, across time, actually, across uh, uh, different centuries where you can actually see the connection from generation to generation in, in that field. So all these non-market values are also important to keep in mind. And, uh, and it's also maybe one of the obstacles for uh, some of the creative industries to develop because who should um, uh, empower the creative industry? Should it be the ministries of culture and the, the whole, the, the, if we talk about the top-down political approach, should it be the, yeah, the, the, the artists, uh, ministries, uh, civil servants, public sector, or should it be more the enterprise or should it be the foreign affairs because it's a really good tool for, um, for, uh, uh, for uh, um, uh, foreign, foreign affairs to use the creative industries as a way to promote, you know, I just need to say Carlsberg and Lego, uh, and then you will have a notion of what is Denmark like? We must be some happy-go-lucky people that like to play. Uh, that's partially true, uh, partially untrue as well. So they can really, they are of course part of a nation branding as well, but that's, as I said before, it's also an obstacle uh, to, to many of the, uh, to, to create policies around creative industries and, and craftsmanship is the fact that where should it be placed? Where should it land? Who should support it? And often we also see the creative uh, sectors uh, competing against each other. Should we uh, in Denmark support the movie industry with half a billion Danish kroner, or should we also allocate some of the money to the gaming industry? Is it important that if we find it important that we have movies in Danish, is it also important that we have games that are with, uh, with Danish values or in Danish language? Should we try to help the Swedes to promote Pippi Longstocking is her the values that are surrounded around Pippi Longstocking being a rebellious, anti-authoritarian, strong uh, girl, uh, woman. Uh, is that uh, is that probably a better uh, um, thing to promote than uh, Peppa Pig? Um, who knows? But uh, so I'm saying that uh, uh, that dichotomy. But where should we place you? And and uh, actually, that the fact that you also many of you compete against each other makes it uh, makes it uh, difficult to, to um, for policymakers to, to craft policies. And that's a pity because um, there's a lot of good stuff that can be done. In 2012 to 2014, I was the chairman of the European Creative Industries Alliance. And there I, I crafted 10 recommendations for governments in Europe to, um, to uh, improve and enhance the creative industries. I was appointed by the commissioner for enterprise, uh, DG Enterprise, as it was called back then, uh, Tajani, who, uh, who uh, then appointed me uh, for this. And I spoke with uh, lots of countries and experts and professors, etc., and came up with the ECIA, European Creative Industries Alliance, uh, 10 policy recommendations. I've also been a co-chair of, of an OMC group on access to finance for the culture and creative sector. And, and here there are lots of good ways that we can do it. Uh, it is really a, a combination of uh, good efforts, good efforts from the public sector, good uh, on, on doing the right stuff, uh, creating the right ecosystems, 
pushing uh, their own financing systems towards the creatives, uh, but also from the private sector side to open up. Um, we know that many uh, companies uh, in Europe will not be there anymore unless they start uh, thinking creatively and thinking outside the box and starting collab to collaborate with uh, creatives. We see numerous examples of how big corporations actually uh, uh, innovate and come out thanks to uh, working together with, um, uh, with creatives. I can give an example, many of you maybe know Lego Architecture. Lego Architecture, you, know, you all know Lego. Lego is a large company doing well, all these Lego bricks. Uh, then there was a American architect that came to Lego and said, why don't you make uh, uh, brick sets for adults where they can actually build iconic buildings. Uh, they, they can build, you know, the Empire State, they can build uh, uh, the Arc de Triomphe for Arc de l'Humanité in, in Paris. Um, so, um, uh, and Lego actually said no. Lego said, no, we're only in it for kids. And then uh, the guy, the architect just started buying the bricks and making his own little boxes and became more and more successful. And eventually Lego bought uh, his idea from him and uh, it's now one of the most successful bus new business ideas for Lego, Lego architecture. Uh, but it wasn't their own idea. And I think among you, the creatives, there are lots of great uh, ideas that are waiting to be commercialized. And some of it you can do yourself, or some of it you can do in, in collaboration with a, a large corporation or a SME that can help you uh, with your expansion. So there are many possibilities. And I must say, there are also, um, uh, this is, a, a, there are also many ways that you can access the network uh, of CBM. So uh, uh, one of the best thing you can do is to join uh, www.thisis.cbnet.com. Um, I um, think I should also wrap up here and in the chat, let's see if I can find it there. Uh, oh, I can't see it right now. Let me just finish my, yeah, let's collaborate and let me show you how you can do that by stop to, stopping to share. Um, and here we go. So in the chat, you now have uh, access to the network. So this is because this is the people, uh, the network. We are, I think we're close to 700 people in there, investors, startups, experts, and they're pretty much from all over the world. And we're increasing uh, right now by the hour, we're getting uh, new members. So join this is cbnet.com. And here you will see uh, a lot of great groups of people working on creative industries in Africa uh, and on a lot of other uh, relevant issues. Uh, you're of course also welcome to contact me and I will write my email down here. So if you have any questions relating to my presentation or how to work with corporates, other stuff, uh, then please let me know. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak at this uh, conference. I hope uh, uh, you will have uh, another second day, uh, fantastic day of exchanges of this uh, really um, interesting and really um, um, uh, necessary, necessary uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus, for your inspirational presentation showing us all the new opportunities. Before I give the floor to our first country today, I will remind you that today is the second day of our crafting business seminar. Supported by uh, Creative Europe, uh, the Crafting Europe project was uh, inspired by the need to build capacity within the craft sector across Europe. It is a partnership between nine expert organizations across eight Europe, European countries. A key focus on this project is to enhance new skills and improve employability of emerging and current professionals in the craft sector. Craft in Europe included different collaborations between makers and artisans. Yesterday, we saw a presentation of program leads, tutors, and participants from four countries. It was Ireland, Spain, Georgia, uh, uh, Ireland, Spain, uh, Spain uh, Ukraine, and uh, uh, today we have uh, more presentations. Uh, so today we'll. Uh, listen also Netherlands, Portugal, Georgia, and Italy. Oh, sorry, and, and UK also was yesterday. Today we'll listen the presentation from Italy, Georgia, the Netherlands, and Portugal. 
And next in our journey is uh, Italy. Uh, Elisa? Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. I'm giving the floor to you. Thank you. Okay, so. Sorry, I have some problem in sharing the screen. Just a moment, please. Okay. Okay, so. First of all, good morning to everybody. Thanks to be here with us. Uh, I will spend just a few words uh, uh, to present uh, ourselves and the activity we uh, we led for uh, the pro the crafting business project. I'm sorry, I have some problem. Just a moment, please. No, sorry. Eh, sì, te lo non me la fa vedere perché c'ho c'ho questo. Ok. Ma ha chiuso, chiuso tutto. Uh, mandalo te, vai. Uh, sorry, ok. Uh, just a moment, we have some trouble with the uh, com uh, computer. Just a few words about Artex. Uh, I don't want to spend uh, too many words because uh, tutors and uh, attendees' uh, uh, speech will be more interesting. Anyway, Artex is uh, a company based in Florence, Italy, which is specialized in artistic and uh, traditional craft since 1995. We act uh, to promote uh, and uh, to valorize and to protect and to innovate uh, artistic and traditional craft in Tuscany and in Italy. Uh, just a small uh, overview on what we do usually. We work uh, uh, with, uh, to organize uh, fairs and events, uh, both at national and international level. Uh, we work to support companies to uh, work with grants and calls, so to be funded by public bodies like uh, regional government or ministry or uh, other kinds of grants and calls. Uh, we work in local promotion, which means to organize projects uh, that link uh, craft to other economic research and cultural research of the, of the territories like such as uh, tourism, culture, museum, and so on. We work in European project and thanks to all partners with uh, Crafting Europe project. We are part of International Craft Network, first of all, the Warcraft Council Europe. And we also work a lot about market and internationalization. Uh, just to, a few words word to explain uh, what is craft in Tuscany and Italy. Uh, craft is composed, craft sector in Italy is composed by workshop, but also by manufacture. So we have uh, craftsmen that uh, need to work uh, with the tourism, anyway, with local consumer. We have companies that work at a very, very high level, uh, high-end uh, companies, uh, which uh, produce uh, unique pieces. And we have also companies of different size that uh, work in international markets and uh, who works in uh, export and who make in export one of the main parts of their businesses. You can have in this uh, slide some of our uh, website uh, that are also different projects that aim to give some answer uh, to help different kinds of companies to be promoted and to be valorized at a, a local, regional, national, international level. Uh, what we did uh, for uh, crafting business, uh, as other partners said, we had to think about a new way to do the 
crafting business unite uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the situation changed and so we were obliged uh, to work on online webinars. But it was, I think, uh, a, a, at the end, it was very useful because it helped us to keep in touch with many companies all over Italy. So it was interesting to work with so many companies and craftsmen and designers and to uh, meet them and to create a new network at a national level for this project. Uh, we tried to specialize our webinars because of uh, pandemic and uh, the uh, crisis created by the pandemic and also because we work a lot about the market and about internationalization and so we work on four topics product design and craftsmanship that was very interesting because we spoke about what new product in craft have to represent how to approach different markets internationalization in grants, communication and social media. We uh, tried so to speak about the main topics in uh, the period of COVID pandemic, but not only. So we started the, our webinars in November 2020 and we had it with the last one in February 2021. We held uh, nine seminars with uh, five expert tutors and we had 50, more than 50 prescriptions and uh, a, about 30 participants for webinar. So we uh, created those meetings that tried to uh, explain, to approach topics with the language of a craftsman because a uh, very interesting topic, but that needed to be uh, presented in a language that was useful for uh, for craftsmen, for workshop, and to explain also new way to present themselves. Here you can find some feedback that we had from our attendees. And uh, what I think is very interesting is the concrete, the term concrete, because it's important in this period to be concrete and to help uh, craftsmen in their everyday life, in their everyday activity, because uh, uh, because of the, of the difficult period we are living in. So uh, we had uh, very uh, positive rates from our uh, webinars and very interesting uh, and very interesting feedback from them. Uh, the second edition of Crafting Business for the, uh, for the Crafting New Project will start in autumn 2021. Uh, we decided to deliver them as webinar, as well we did uh, last, uh, last session. Uh, they will have a national level and they will involve new tutors. We are working on define new topics uh, to be approached in the next uh, edition. And so you can find more information about Artex and about our activity in our website and our uh, social channels. You have here all the link. Should you need further information, we are here to answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, we are going to our next speaker from Italy. Who's next? Oh, so I think that's Maria Elena, please. Uh -huh. Maria Elena, can you hear us? Um, I think she's going to have some problem if we can move on our uh, participant. Yeah, we can move to Agnes. Thank you. Yes, yes. If you like. Hello. You can Hello? start your presentation. Hi. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. So, um, my greetings to everybody of you. Uh, my name is Agnes Birschnabel, 
uh, German by origin, as uh, you can hear the name, and Italian by adoption since 1987. I am a designer and ceramic of ceramic materials and a trainer. My artistic ceramic workshop is uh, inside the wall of a former monastery, Santa Margherita, uh, in the city of Como, Lombardy. It's a very small one woman business. And I work very, uh, mainly with stoneware and porcelain, partially on commission, creating artistic objects of different types, furnishing accessories, artistic favors, jewelry, and so on. I often combine ma marine wood uh, or with other natural material with my work. As it happens to many of my colleagues, the pandemic has put me in a serious crisis, above all, because it has suddenly canceled all the direct sales events I usually attended uh, during the year. So not being particularly familiar with the targeted use of social media, I felt the need to receive some help to find a new orientation, to know more about online sales channels and the possibility of obtaining more visibility for my work. Attending the crafting business webinars was very helpful to me because I received a lot of information and new ideas. For example, through the episode on transitional design, I met the Artemis platform for Italian craftsmanship. And since the beginning of this year of 2021, I have been there with a small part of my production. Before saying goodbye now, with a thought to my female ceramic colleagues who may be present here today, I wanted to say that since 2018, I have been part of the Italian association Andorra Artiste Ceramiste, which promotes the artistic work of women in the ceramic field. Born as a very active local association of Cava de Tirreni near Naples, it has recently grown a lot and it has now members all over the world. Our Matras International Festival of Women's Ceramics in 2020 took place uh, online, obviously for uh, the COVID pandemic, and it has been a great international success. So ladies, if you are interested uh, to join us, please contact us, we will be happy. My special thanks now go to the organizers of this inter-European meeting. The situation that has arisen is really difficult. We will only be able to overcome it by joining our forces in the search for solutions and new ways. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye. Thank you. And we move on. I think that Maria Elena now here with us. Or Christina will be next. I think we'll go with Christina, please, if you're ready to share your screen. Yeah, please. Okay. Hi, Christina. Hi everybody. Hi. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can you see it? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Uh, hi everyone and thank you for inviting me to speak. My name is Cristina Mariani and I'm a textile artist based in Prato, a textile district close to Florence, Italy. I have a digital background. In fact, after finishing the Art Academy, I worked several years as a graphic and web designer until the desire to go back to work with my hands and create something with a more concrete presence became too strong. So I decided to go back to my passion, textile, and I studied tapestry and hand weaving. I work with different kinds of looms, vertical, horizontal frame looms, to create tapestries and hand woven pieces. I work in two different ways that often intersect and influence each other. One more related to contemporary art, 
showcasing museums and galleries with a conceptual background. And the other one related to fashion. I have a small production of unique accessories and I also collaborate with fashion brands. So I'm going to show you some of my tapestries. I work with a traditional Gobelin technique and in my most recent work, I wanted to give a three-dimensional shape to my tapestries, turning them into sculptures and leaving the unwoven part free. Uh, here's another aspect of textile culture I focused on in my research, which is chanting. Uh, chanting is rhythm that follows the act of weaving and is an element of cohesion between textile workers. In this work called the Song of Uprising and Freedom, the sound spectrogram, a graphic representation of some popular protest song from textile workers has been woven, embroidered or tied with the shibori technique. I have a small production of unique accessories like scarves, shawls, blankets, belts, necklaces, which I started recently. And I also collaborate with fashion brands. I work mainly on commission and I try to recycle my own textile waste. So as you can see, I'm a sort of artist artisan and I feel like an hybrid even though the boundaries between these two areas are often blurry. So it's not easy for me to place myself and my product. I appreciated the possibility to participate in the crafting business course, which has been very useful to me in many ways. First of all, because I am still in the beginning part of my activity and I have a lot to plan. I think passion and determination are necessary to work in this field, but they need to be supported by correct strategy. So you have to set your goal and be consistent, um, have a design strategy, a business strategy, and knowing that marketing uh, means knowing the client and its values. And you can apply also for grants and fundings, which are very important to uh, continue your business. So uh, that's my story and thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And uh, I will ask again if Maria Elena yeah, she had the problem, so we are trying to uh, reach her. I apologize for now, and maybe if it's possible, we can back. Okay. We can after. come back to Italy one more time later, Thank yes? You. Sorry. Yeah, Thank you. great. Uh, thanks to all speakers, and now we move on to hear some insights and success stories from our next project partner for today. Georgia, Maka, hi. Yeah. Hello. I give floor to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, glad to see you all, and uh, thank you for this great opportunity to be, first of all, part of this great team, great project. And um, we are uh, Georgian Arts and Culture Center. This is an NGO with uh, 25 years of background. And in few words, I will tell you that our organization was founded in a very difficult time period when Soviet system was break down and when the art world in general and culture world, but especially we're talking now about the crowds people, no, they have a real difficulties in surviving. So a support of uh, craft, um, craftsmen, a support of uh, applied artists, as well as uh, lately coming to the design was very, very um, actual. And so during all these times, we were trying to support them with the, first of all, with the um, some knowledge for with capacities, uh, uh, also with trainings, even giving them sm small grants. Uh, and uh, now during the, with this time, we also became an, an accredited NGO at uh, Intangible Heritage uh, part of UNESCO, 
starting from uh, 2018. And of course, we are the member of the World Crafts Council Europe. And thank you for you all for that. And uh, uh, as working for the uh, cultural heritage preservation, we are also the repre we are representative uh, re representation of Europa Nostra in Georgia. So uh, in few words, our activities, as I mentioned, covered the, first of all, the uh, crafts uh, support and the development of crafts uh, and design sector, but also um, in this, uh, we are working for preservation of cultural heritage. Uh, we are um, doing the working for um, uh, cultural studies, uh, like conferences, uh, um, seminars, uh, and trainings and in our group we uh, in our under our uh, group was established a social enterprise historially supporting the uh, crafts people who were who are pro producing uh, the um, crafts uh, products based on uh, cultural heritage uh, we also established the Crafts Association uh, that um, also unites, uh, and uh, this is kind of network of uh, uh, crafts all over, craftsmen all over the Georgia, com coming up to 500 members. And um, another big event that we all invite you also to join. This is Ethnofest. This is International Summit. Uh, we were in the physical phase uh, space uh, until uh, uh, the COVID, uh, but now we have also this on the um, um, website. On the website, so you can always uh, join our group uh, uh, for that. Uh, now I would like to mention several words about the project uh, and I will try to be very short. And the, first of all, I I'll already appreciate uh, that I'm with Georgia and GACC is uh, uh, so um, participating in this uh, group, this, this team. Uh, here I'd like to mention that uh, uh, we are also implementing uh, this uh, project in cooperation uh, with the USAID Economic Security Program. And this is important that outside from Europe, also we have joined some um, kind of support and also the partnership. Uh, this our first edition of the crafting business courses uh, were uh, starting from 24th of October and um, covering December uh, 29th, 2020th. Uh, and in total, it covers uh, 20 days, 22 days. Uh, we had 23 participants. And important is that the second edition will um, again be started from uh, the spring of uh, 2021. Uh, here are the some um, uh, tutors and um, our trainers uh, who were actively involved uh, with the group of our um, uh, trainees. And the main tutor is David Chachilashvili, who will speak uh, about himself. He, uh, but uh, I would like to underline that the main um, uh, topics that were, um, were introduced by David are the uh, business visioning and modeling, marketing, accessibility to grant uh, announcements and support funds, business plan presentation. And important is that during all this time period, David was in the direct communication with our group and also it was has very friendly uh, environment and the very interactive um, structure of communication and important also is that after this uh, uh, st um, this um, edition was finished everybody was just uh, looking uh, became the very good friends not only in their professional ways but also in a kind of a private ways as well here are also some our another tutors who um, make the uh, trainings for the finances, for 
uh, product development, uh, also for communication, um, mobile photography, uh, also in for intercultural, uh, sorry, for the export and the, some internationalization. I will not uh, pro pronounce their names because Georgian names are very hard to pronounce. So I will move to the another. Um, topic and a slide, and I need to mention here that uh, uh, because of this pandemic situation, they all and but we still had the uh, opportunity to have the only one but a face to face seminar, uh, and um, that was the only first uh, day of this. Um, uh, edition, uh, but still we had possibility to meet to each other and uh, to express uh, and talk about uh, each of the um, background of our participants. Uh, here I will mention that in total, I already, as I mentioned, we had 23 participants. Uh, among them, the individual entrepreneurs were 35%, organizations 65%, there were the female or 82%, and uh, uh, male 18. Uh, we, our participants were under the 30th age, 30% uh, and over the 30th, 7%. And um, in covering whole Georgia, and uh, we had the 91% from the capital, from Tbilisi, and uh, from regions, 9%. Uh, uh, here we have some quotations uh, uh, that express uh, their um, uh, emotions uh, and uh, their um, like visions of this uh, crafting business uh, uh, seminars, uh, and I will not uh, follow them as some of them will talk um, for themselves. Uh, I will just only mention that um, uh, this, of course, all these uh, uh, seminars were uh, shooted and uh, these shootages, shootages will be uh, published on the GACC educational platform. Uh, at this stage, it's, they are on in Georgian, but we will work to uh, translate them to English and then it will be uh, possible also for worldwide. So I was trying to be as short as possible and uh, I'm giving my um, floor to our tutor, to David Chechelashvili and hope with hope to see you next time. David, please. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I was worried a little bit. I'm in an open space, so there is I hope there is not too much background noise. Hello, everyone. No, it's all perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, Maka. Um, I was at Maka mentioned I was a, a coach. I don't like the word tutor, so I will refer. I prefer to refer to myself as coach, or even better, mentor. Uh, and uh, I will be brief. Uh, I want to leave more time uh, for Matasi and Teona. Uh, who were involved and uh, I think they will speak better about the results than me uh, because I'm not impar I'm impar I'm not impartial. Uh, let me uh, start from the beginning. So I'm a serial entrepreneur. Uh, I am uh, um, I have some connection with creative industries. My uh, two last startups that I co-founded were in, uh, in at operating at the intersection of uh, entertainment and technology. Uh, close to Hollywood business, uh, 3D technology in cinemas. Um, and uh, when Maka contacted me uh, back before the program started, I was a little, uh, I didn't think that my experience would be relevant. However, uh, I changed my mind and what I saw, actually I never regretted that I agreed to, to do this uh, because uh, of what I will describe to you now. Uh, first of all, um, uh, my experience uh, in Georgia, uh, since I came back to Georgia, I'm heavily involved in uh, building the startup ecosystem. Uh, uh, there are no uh, craft-related uh, businesses in startup ecosystem. My hesitancy was um, uh, I didn't never regretted that I agreed because uh, we actually managed to modify 
a typical lean startup based approach that you use for high tech, high growth startups uh, for craft micro craft related micro businesses. And I think it worked well. And uh, I believe it might be something new that participants of this program might take with them. Um, um, but uh, of course, a bit better to hear from uh, from uh, participants itself, but I just want to stress a couple of points. The way that this program was modified, there are some parts of lean startup methodologies that are applicable and even, even good, especially for businesses that are uh, operating during COVID. As you know, COVID affected everyone. COVID affected Georgia significantly in a sense that uh, we are very heavily tourism dependent and our uh, uh, participants are very heavily, we are very heavily tourism dependent. So this was a good time for a training because as you know, the, the training, uh, when you learn something new, you are doing, if you, le if you learn something new, you are learn something new, you are doing things differently. And when is a good time to start doing something things differently? In a time of a change. Uh, and this was, the timing was very, very good. Uh, the training focused uh, on, on my, on the entrepreneurial side, uh, because as you saw from Marcus presentations, there were several uh, modules. My module was entrepreneurial business development sales and uh, specific focus on, was on learning what we really are selling uh, instead of uh, what we think are selling, what our customers are buying, which, which very often are different. Uh, another focus was on a market segmentation. It's very hard for entrepreneurs, whether it doesn't matter whether you are in a craft business or a high tech or a, for any entrepreneur, it's very hard to do narrow segmenting. Uh, and focus specifically on one customer segment uh, because you, is the things where, you know, why we're missing out on other segments because, uh, and typically when the sales are not going well, your first instinct is to expand. Uh, we're not focus more on a, on a specific in industry or a segment. So segmentation was another focus. Uh, the metrics was another focus because the metrics is a part that was probably the most significantly different from high growth startups. The typically met metrics in high growth startups are growth, right? Everything that is connected to growth. In, in our case, since we're talking with micro businesses, the metrics has to be more branding related versus direct marketing related. Not when branding, you know, is, is less measurable there is less data that you have that allows you to measure the brand than, than with direct marketing. Uh, however, overall, I was very, I was, I was very pleased with the results. I met a, a very nice group of open-minded entrepreneurs that that were like sponges. Um, uh, since I had interactions with them after the program. I know that many of them are doing things differently, which is to me as a, as a mentor is a best indication that they learn something. Um, otherwise, you know, what's the point, right? If we're still doing the same way, uh, that means that uh, we didn't really learn anything, but I know that most of them are really doing something differently. So I wanna keep this short and I, I think the most value we'll see from presentations from, from participants, Matasi and Teona, uh, thank you very much, and uh, would be happy to answer any of your questions if you write them down here in the question portion. Thank you very much, and we go next to Matasi. Yes, hello. <clears throat> Hi, let me share the screen. Yes, I'm a co-host now. Okay, here we go. So, uh, as you know, I'm the graduate of the program. Uh, I would say that I'm a painter, but at this moment I'm a freelancer graphic designer, uh, lettering and calligraphy artist. And before this, I used to work in advertising for ages in Leo Burnett, Moscow and Mac in London. So that's my background. And uh, just to see what I'm talking about, here are some of my recent works. 
uh, even though I have background in advertising, I had no idea of the side of the business, which is the business. <laughs> and I found that uh, this program was providing exactly that. And so that's why I decided to participate. And uh, me and my partner had an idea, but we were not in a hurry to begin it because uh, of the lack of the knowledge, uh, making the business planning, etc. And also the out outbreak came and everything slowed down. So uh, I was very happy to find out that I was, uh, our main coach was Mr. David, because I've heard a lot of uh, success stories, his success stories before. So it was really a nice opportunity for us. Uh, so now I would like to present our pitch deck presentation uh, of me and my partners and uh, which we created uh, during the course uh, and to have in mind that this is just the idea part of the presentation and before that we had no idea what was the pitch deck <laughs> generally so uh, this course helped us to make this thing so uh, here we go uh, everywhere around us live gentle creatures who need special care and attention uh, but unfortunately, the reality is this, and it's getting worse day by day, and we can't change it in a day. Uh, but the formula is out there, and the role of you is crucial and very important. A uh, healthy way of life, diet, exercises, is there anything else we can really do? Uh, our mission is to put the little healthy habits in our children's lives. Every little thing creates a bigger picture. So there are a lot of research, historical facts, and even legends about the health benefits of silver. Our solution to implement healthy habits, silver's kits, and silver's positive properties is a simple everyday object which is used regardless of age, interest, etc. A silver spoon. Uh, the simplicity of the spoon itself gives us the opportunity to implement a lot of variation and design and it can be tailored for kids specifically. It also gives us the possibilities to create stories, collections, fairy tales, themes, uh, some educational stuff, etc. And how it came to us that uh, we all know this quote that all grown ups were once children, but few of them remember it. So let me explain what is our value and how we get to this idea. Uh, creating a lifelong object product, which can be like an emotional time capsule in the future is our drive. The object that can bring back the sweet childhood memories and even can be passed down through generations with the history that you create yourself. Added benefit to the product is beneficial for child's healthy upbringing. Our main mission is to package these emotions and health benefits in a way in which it will be attractive for both for children and for adults alike. Uh, our main priority is visual aesthetic side of the project and the nostalgia and heritage to the mix and it creates the harmonious emotionally, emotionally satisfying product. So uh, uh, the shortest way for a spoon to reach a kid is a present, a gift which is given at a young age by someone who cares for the child very much and who wishes to put the emotion and meaning in simple meaning in a simple thing. Uh, we believe that our product sales point is, uh, best fits as a gift from godparents. These kids are our, me and my partner's godchildren. Uh, the ancient tradition, you know, the, is, is highly regarded in our country. Moreover, the godparents have a big role uh, in bringing up the child. That's why we as godparents included me and Mariam try to put a bit more values and meanings in our gifts for little ones. So this is our idea and part of our pitch the presentation. Thank you very much, 
And we are going to our next speaker, Teona. Yes, welcome, Teona. Hello, everyone. Is my screen visible now? Yes. Okay, so let's start. Uh, my name is Teona Gorgiashvili. Uh, I'm 33 years old and it is great honor for me to be a participant of the first crafting business seminar. Uh, by profession, I'm international relations specialist and I work in a British petroleum subcontractor company for 11 years uh, till present. At the same time, I'm a pottery artist. Uh, five years ago, I started attending ceramic workshops in my country. Uh, at the beginning, it was uh, like a hobby for me, but uh, when I went deep inside the process, I understood that uh, it was the field of art uh, I always wanted to be in. Uh, so I started learning with throwing techniques and became a professional pottery artist. Uh, during these years, I took part in many ceramic exhibitions in Georgia. I traveled in India, in South Asia, and in Africa in order to learn their traditional techniques of processing the clay and firing. Uh, my artworks are various, but all of them are combined with one unique value, and uh, this is its uh, positive energy, which is uh, radiated from all of my artworks. Uh, mostly my creations are inspired by nature and you can see botanical hand drawings on them. Also travel inspires me a lot and my ceramic collections are divided with these uh, characteristics as well. In photos, uh, you can see also Japanese uh, style tea set collections inspired by Japanese traditional tea ceremonies. And this collection is Teo Ceramics bestseller product. Also, you can see yoga sculptures. And uh, as I am doing yoga myself uh, for many years, it inspired me to do some asanas and movements in shape of uh, sculptures. My artworks are identification and expression of my personality. Um, I have my online shop named Teo Ceramics on social media, Facebook and Instagram, and on the biggest online shopping platform, Etsy.com. In uh, crafting business training program, our main mentor and trainers shared their expertise and knowledge to support the business development to the newcomers to this industry. We will learn how to build business skills, generate revenue. We learned marketing skills and promotion in craft enterprises. We learned fundamentals of business visioning and modeling and how to gain skills that will strengthen our business performance. I already apply the tools which I have learned in my own business. Uh, during this program, I have learned basics of business visioning and modeling, marketing strategies, how to make a research and access to the market, uh, access to the funding supports and grants applications, and also how to write an effective business plan. During this lockdown period, when online shops became so active, in order to perform our products more effectively and visually perceivable, photography skills and techniques became so essential. So I think mobile photography trainings were uh, very timely for us. Uh, our tutor uh, coach, Mr. David, taught us how to make customer segmentation, how to set out marketing strategies, we learned sales and distribution channels. We were taught essential elements of a powerful, unique selling propo proposition. I want to underline the most significant part of our seminars, which played the key role during the whole program. And this is uh, the core of a successful business, our value proposition, which is the most important. It should appeal to emotions of the customers. We should care about core competencies since they are the roots of a competitive advantage. Uh, value is the worth. Value delivered to the customer results in a satisfied customer who will pay a reasonable price in return to your product or service. Uh, we should walk in our target customer's shoes. We should define their characteristics. We should ask them the right questions and analyze the answers. Why questions? To find their needs. We should uncover hidden needs and bring the desire to satisfy needs to a boiling point. 
So at last, I want to thank partners of the Creative Europe project, Crafting Europe, and Georgian Arts and Culture Center for giving us such a great opportunity to deliver our skills and business during this lockdown period. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much to our Georgian speakers. And now we are taking a break of uh, Shona 10 minutes. Uh, I think 10 minutes. And Thank after you. the break, we are looking forward to hear the next uh, country, Netherlands. That's great. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yes, it's 11.40 a.m. GMT time. Um, and hope to see everyone back then. Thanks again, everyone. project supported by the by creative europe project it is a partnership between nine expert organizations across eight european countries uh, crafting europe included different collaborations between makers and artisans and yesterday we listed program leads tutors and participants from partner countries uh, uh, ireland spain uk and ukraine today we listen uh, the presentation from italy Georgia, and uh, now we are going to the Netherlands. Marion? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Um, yeah. I can share my screen. Um, can you make me host? Uh, yes, Shana will. Your co host are ready, Marion, so you should be able to share your screen. Can I share already? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, hmm, I don't know what's going on. Wait a minute. No problem. Just while Marion is getting her presentation ready, um, just to say to anyone, if at the end of the session, we'll be doing the Q&A. So if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A section at the bottom of, the, of your Zoom call. And we'd be very happy to direct them to the relevant person. Thank you. Uh, well, we tried to fix, but I start already with, with a short introduction about the um, Crafts Council of Netherlands. Um, we are here with uh, our team. And um, oh, I will also, now you cannot see me but I, I will have a short introduction. We are here with our team. Uh, I'm here together with Willemien Ippel and Guusje Hees-Akkers, and we are the team of Crafts Council Netherlands. We are the platform of the crafts, and um, uh, we work from the heart of the Netherlands in Utrecht, but we work national and international as well. And we support and promote the makers. We work with, um, uh, um, sorry, I don't know what's going on, but well, yeah, we, we promote and uh, support our makers. We work with artisans, but also with maker designers. And we have a cross map with excellent makers of the Netherlands. We also promote them on the Dutch Design Week and um, that's in the Netherlands every year. We are partner of the Dutch Design Week and together we, um, we present uh, the importance of making and the importance of crafts during that week. We also promote our makers uh, international um, fairs and um, bien biennials. And um, we, well, we have uh, also every year a theme, and this year we are focusing on basketry. 
We always work with heritage and innovation and this year we, uh, we focus on basketry and we have a lot of activities like talks, expert meetings, master classes, a challenge and we present the results on the Dutch Design Week in October 2021. If you are interested, you can follow us on Instagram, you can see it below. And now I go to Crafting Business. We are happy and proud member of the Crafting Europe Network and we also had our Crafting Business course. And I show you some facts. We did it um, in September 2020. We did it offline because we thought peer learning is very important. And so, because it was offline, we, we started with a small group of 14 um, participants. It was a very nice group with young makers, but also with career switches. And the age was between 25 and 52. And a lot of different disciplines were, uh, were there, from shoemaker to ceramics, from embroidery to, to weaving. And we had uh, 10 fantastic teachers, all um, experts in their fields. But unfortunately, the, the final two days, uh, we had to do it online because of the pandemic. I show you some, some uh, snapshots, some pictures to get an idea how it was here. We had a nice place where we had a course and there was also a space outside where we could work, which was very nice because of the pandemic. And you see here the participants working on their assignments. And one of the first assignments was draw your, uh, the envision, the, the bigger picture. What is your dream? Because we think it's very important to start with, with from your heart and what, what yeah, from, your, from the dreams. So Crafting Business uh, 2 will start at the 1st of September and there are also some lessons learned from Crafting Business 1. Uh, for example, we, the Crafting Business 1 uh, was every week but now uh, we do it every two weeks. We still want to do it offline in Utrecht and uh, also the participants also asked for more time to process during the course days so we have less speakers and if there are already some people joining now and thinking oh i really want to join if you want to apply you can um, email Guusje, but you can also wait a, a couple of weeks because the announcement will be soon This in short, uh, I hand uh, over now to Marion Beltman. She is the main tutor and she brought in the importance of, uh, to, of making an artist statement and she will talk about that now. So I hand over the floor to Marion. Are you there? Yes, yeah, you are muted. Yeah, yeah I, I am there. I would like to yeah, share my I... screen. What do I have to, is there a... Hi, Mari. If you can just press the green share screen button, please, at the bottom. Right, I will. Okay. Perfect. If you want to go into presentation mode. Right. Um, will you be able to see the screen now? Yes. Yeah, okay, that's nice. Well, um, thank you for having me. Thank you for my, uh, to my colleague, Marion. My name is also Marion, to make it easy for you listeners. Um, thank you for having me and thanking uh, you for having the opportunity to say something about uh, the importance of a solid and attractive, remarkable maker statement or artist statement or uh, value proposition, whatever you want to call it. It's all the same in my opinion. Um, it is important as a maker, uh, um, an artist, a designer, a photographer, um, whatever the, 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 the trade is you're working in, the discipline you're working in, it is important to have a solid uh, statement, in my opinion. And um, 
I'll explain you a bit more why. Um, uh, by coincidence, my colleague Marion um, took the same uh, screenshot from my website. Um, when I work as a consultant or lecturer in the arts, uh, I focus with my students or cultural organizations on uh, entrepreneurship. And um, this is because we all want um, your artwork to be seen, admired, and preferably also be sold. Uh, so um, that's why I work with everyone uh, on entrepreneurship. And I think the main starting point is to start with a statement uh, about your work. Um, the, well, yeah, I, I think you can read this for yourself. Uh, this screen is also in my presentation um, that I will send to uh, the organization after this seminar. And I uh, would like you all to um, download it, uh, this presentation and look into it because I have added some more slides to explain some more in depth. But uh, since we only have five minutes or so, I have to stick to the slides um, I will present right now. Um, so um, yeah, um, I found out that people find it very hard to develop a make a statement. And that's why I came up with this funnel, this um, triangle uh, uh, upside down. And um, what I always ask people um, to write down what their vision is on this world, that could be uh, an, an, an engagement, uh, a specific fascination, and uh, once you write this down, it's easier to come to um, write down your, your mission or your drive. Uh, and um, then you conclude with your activities. Um, so um, this might still sound a little bit abstract to you. And um, in the presentation that you can find afterwards uh, uh, on the seminar, uh, you'll find an explanation on these words. But for now, I think um, it might be a lot uh, more attractive to uh, see a few uh, examples. Um, the uh, advantage of a um, good and solid maker statement is, in my opinion, that um, you, um, when, it, when, when the statement is, is remarkable, is, out, uh, is, is outstanding and remarkable, it's worth making a remark about. And that's what we want. We want to be... Uh, we want our work to be um, uh, talked about. And um, once you have this solid, solid artist statement, uh, you'll be able to attract the right audience as well. And um, a, a trained uh, person can also help you, guide you to find um, the right sources of income once you have this uh, statement um, yeah, finished. Um, as I said, I would like to show you a few examples. Um, this lady, she um, makes ceramics, not just ceramics, but this is an, a soundscape installation uh, where she uses her ceramics. And you can see where, she, where her fascination is uh, and her engagement. Um, so you can read this for yourself, uh, but she finds the wor world a little bit abstract and she wants people to be more aware of the physical matter. And um, that's what she lies, lays emphasis on. So this is a, an example of a vision. And then we go to the second layer uh, of the funnel. And that's, that is the, the mission. And I find this example of this lady photographer very striking. Uh, she just not, she says she's not just a photographer, uh, but her street, uh, her dream is to make the street safe for women to walk on. And I, in my opinion, it gives her a lot of um, space to uh, come up with either photography or a, a movie or a, a lecture or um, whatever. Uh, so uh, once you think uh, that a, a make statement restricts you, then um, I would like to um, um, combat would be the word. Uh, I would like to have a, a different uh, perspective on it. So, um, yeah, um, I would like to encourage you to um, write this, uh, make a statement for yourself using this funnel, uh, using the steps I just described really quick. And um, I can understand that this is only a short uh, explanation, but you'll find a lot more in-depth information in the presentation, as I said before. 
So um, I, let me conclude by um, showing you the last slide. Um, I can understand that this raises lots of questions. Um, so feel free to send me an email um, to my address more at marianbelman.nl or um, look at my website if you feel like it. Um, I would conclude by thanking you for your attention. And I would like to give the floor to Veronica uh, Pock and Fenna, uh, both participants of the course crafting business. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. And uh, Fenna, are you here? Yes. Yes, so you can start your presentation. So can you all see this in full screen? Yes. 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 Yeah. OK, perfect. Well, um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fenna van der Klei, uh, and I am a Dutch designer. And I work from my studio in Rotterdam. Um, I am a textile and product designer. Um, and I create sensory objects that stimulate the senses, uh, charm, and persuade. Uh, with my designs, I react to the dematerialization that comes with our digitalizing environment. Um, and I see that the relationship between human beings and their surrounding products is shifting. Um, the presence uh, of physical objects is decreasing, being replaced by smart living. And I believe that uh, this is why we pick our surrounding products based upon uh, emotional and decorative values more than ever. In my work, um, I value, revalue and reinterpret uh, traditional crafts. After all, this is where uh, precious material knowledge lies, I think. Um, and in order to do so, uh, I create crossovers between traditional craft and high-tech production systems. And one of my ongoing researches within my design practice is the reinterpretation of uh, the craft of weaving. And I would like to show you two outcomes of this research. So the first outcome uh, I created for Fashion Clash, uh, which is a Dutch fashion uh, platform. Uh, they invited me to design a new type of weaving uh, and apply it within fashion. Um, so I analyzed different kinds of tartan weaves, um, abstracted those and developed a new um, three-dimensional woven structure. And another outcome of the same uh, research um, presents the table jewel collection. Um, and these textiles uh, open structures don't conform to a fixed shape and they invite to be touched. Um, the heat resistant home textiles are like jewels on the dinner table um, and they can be used as coasters. So the most important thing uh, the crafting uh, business program made me realize is uh, my goal to work towards a business that works for me, creating a self-fulfilling working environment instead of me working for my business. Um, and in order to achieve this, both financially and creatively, uh, I got motivated and taught uh, to set very clear and structured goals uh, within my design practice. Um, and it made me see where my talents lie, formulate my uh, maker statement, but also showed me my specific lacks uh, and the fact that I don't need to solve those um, individually necessarily. And in, in, in order to tackle these gaps, I now join forces with uh, other creative outsourcing tasks that I find difficult. And all the steps, um, in order to work towards my ideal business scenario are captured in my personal uh, business canvas model. Um, a system explained to me uh, during the crafting business program. 
providing me a steady professional fundament to hold on to. And with my clear uh, goals and maker statement uh, having set now, um, thanks to the program, uh, I'm now applying for a talent development grant. And this will hopefully support me uh, to reach out to local production companies for collaboration, fulfilling my uh, maker wishes. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, feel free to contact me if you like to know more, if you have any questions. And now I would like to give the floor to Veronica, I think is next. Hi, Veronica. Oh, hi. Um, I'll just share my screen. So, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah, good. Um, so, my name is Veronica Park. Um, I'm originally from the UK. I've lived in the Netherlands for a long time. Um, and my background, I'm actually a career switcher, but uh, I did study fashion and textiles a number of years ago, and I've been carrying that on uh, alongside my original career. Um, in 2017, I decided to pursue my creative practice full time, um, and I'm a hand weaver and an artist, um, and I work in the medium of textiles and I make functional handwoven pieces, so scarves, interior textiles, and also um, decorative pieces. Um, and these are more experimental pieces, um, uh, woven uh, artworks. Um, so uh, I've been working, uh, for a number of years full time then on my creative practice, three or four years, um, but I felt that I was really lacking direction. Um, and I was lacking um, several skills like financial skills and promotional skills and really um, yeah, needing a network, a sort of support network. Um, so that's when I applied to crafting business. Um, uh, to, to try and find the direction of my work, I found the, the artist statement uh, hugely helpful. Uh, working with Marion, I was able to develop um, my vision and mission for my creative business. So I realized that uh, it was very important to me to hand make everything myself because that gives my woven textiles their individuality. Um, I've, I've worked on every single piece of them. Uh, so they hold my, um, my maker's mark. Um, so finding my vision and mission statement was really, really helpful. Um, and it's given me a clear direction where I want to go. Um, part of my values recognize that the world is becoming increasingly uniform because everything is being mass produced. Uh, and there's a need for individually produced items that have integrity and honesty. Um, and uh, so that was uh, something that came out of finding my artist statement. Uh, I was able to expand on my artist statement. Um, and this gave me uh, a way of working and a clear framework. So how I can continue my work um, by connecting with the materials. Um, it's enabled me to refine my work as well. So on the left, you can see one of my handwoven artworks. I've really begun to refine these um, by framing them and um, presenting them in a much more professional way. Uh, the center image is uh, detail. And then on the right, you can see one of my handwoven scarves. And I've started to work together with um, clients much more closely through commissions. And I find this is very beneficial. It goes two ways because the, um, the client benefits, they learn about the process of how things are made. And I always find that I learn something when I work on a commission because I'm pushed to use more different materials and different colors. Um, so that's, that's another way of working that was brought to me through the crafting business program. Um, so for my future work, I now have a clear idea of where I want to go and what I want to focus on. I want to continue to produce the handwoven unique uh, scarves and um, interior 
textiles, but I also want to focus on the handwoven artworks that I make. And this is some of my new work that I'm working on at the moment that has um, a specific um, value given to it by the materials that I use. So I'm using repurposed materials. This is old uh, paper um, and using that to create artworks that hopefully people will want to look at and uh, investigate how they're made, look more closely. Um, and in that way, you can build, I can build up a relationship with the audience and spread the word about how uh, weaving uh, is, is carried out. Um, and oops. so finally, um, I just carrying out the going through the crafting business program was really um, a really beneficial uh, to me. It helped me to reassert and see myself as an artist who was working with hand weave rather than as a hand weaver designing products. So I, I really focused and now I know what my identity is and what unique um, aspects there are to my work. It helped me to increase my confidence and see the value of what I'm making. And that's reflected in my uh, pricing strategy. And um, when I'm talking to people, I can talk with much more confidence because what I do is something special. Um, I also identified and resolved my weaknesses, which is um, I'm starting to build up a network of contacts now, um, fellow craftspeople, the student, the fellow students on the course were really, it was great talking to them and they help you to see your work in a different way and um, also a support network outside of, of that group. And I've been able to refine my work and um, I'm starting to collate testimonials so that I can then introduce this to a wider audience. So really crafting business has set me on a, a really good uh, path for the future. And I now know where I'm going and what I'm going to make. And the, yeah, the artist statement was the, the starting point for all of that. So really, I'd just like to finish by saying a really big thank you to everyone uh, on, on the programme um, and hopefully we can see each other again soon, COVID restrictions um, allowing and it would be really nice to, to uh, maintain that contact. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, that's thank everything you. from me. So I'll pass over to uh, Portugal, I think. Uh, just a few words before. So thanks for the speakers from uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, supporting Marion's speech, I want to add that it happened that uh, because of COVID-19, our project partners and the whole world could experience the first global and major <laughs> training in digitalization. And today we are witnessing how the challenge to organize a seminar with partners, tutors, participants, from eight countries of the whole world turns to a really great event. And now we switch uh, to Portugal. Uh, hello, Anna Cristina. Now you have the stage. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello. Okay, I think I'm... <laughs> Something is happening here. So, uh, porque eu já estou a fazer compartilhamento de tela. Ana Cristina, so we can see you and hear you clearly if you just want to share your screen. Ah, ok. Me sinto recuperar. De todos os outros, sim. Ok. So, I'm going to share my screen. Everything. Ok. Como é que está a apresentação? João, o que é que está a passar aqui? Não, não tem uhum. O que é que escolheu? Compartilhamento de tela. E agora? Mas ele não me deixa ir aqui. Lá está. É que isto já estava cá. Sim, está no nosso ecrã. Ok. Sorry. No problem, Ana Cristina. Just get yourself ready there. 
Um, and again, just a reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, you can pop them into the Q&A and we'll be doing that straight after all the presentations by Portugal. Okay. Are you seeing now? Yes, perfect. Okay, let me just shut down for now. Okay. Okay. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to do a brief presentation for those who don't know CERT. I'm going to do a brief presentation of CERT. We are a vocational training center for crafts and heritage. We are a public organization and we work uh, national wide in Portugal. Uh, we we held um, we have more or less like four thousand trainees each year and around 250 um, courses each year. We have other responsibilities too um, in the, the organization of the sector. And we also do consultancy uh, for, um, for craftsmen and we support and mentor just about 100 um, craftsmen each year. We also have some experience in um, European projects like this one. Um, we we are participating and we are very glad to participate in this in this crafting Europe project, and uh, we are very glad to be part of this project. And we uh, we would like to share our experience in this specific activity that was the crafting business. So we, I'm working not by myself. Uh, I, I'm I'm the lead of this this team, but uh, João and Fernando that are, that are uh, participating also in this in, in, in this webinar are um, are the the the, 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 the the other members of the team that we uh, we have here in CERT to implement this project. So we. We haven't yet finished the crafting business. So we started later than the other ones. So in this moment, we, um, we are going to share our ongoing experience uh, at this moment. We, um, we promoted the project in 2020 and we, like everybody else, were taken by surprise by the pandemic. And we, uh, at the beginning, we struggled to uh, implement the project in in a in a model face to face, um, in a model of face to face. So we realized that it wouldn't be possible. So we um, we we change all the model to an online project uh, implementation. So in in 2020, we disseminate the project. We we we. Um, in social networks, we sent newsletters and made some talks, and we were quite successful with our open call. We had 53 um, uh, project suppliants, as we selected 20, and uh, for this pro for this process, we had uh, two internal uh, jury members, that was Fernando and João, and we we had also three external members to, of the jury to select all the projects. Uh, we, I say here that we started in, in January the, the 8th, but it's not true. We um, profiting from uh, the opening in December, we were able to, to do two small um, encounters with, uh, with uh, the, the participants. We held uh, a meeting in Lisbon to meet face to face all the participants from the south of Portugal. And we uh, made another one in Coimbra to, where the, the CRC headquarters are settled. And we met all face to face all the group from the center and north of Portugal. Generally, our, our participants are five men, 14 women. Uh, the ages are, um, as you see, mainly between 25 and 44. And uh, we have many crafts represented in, in, the, in the group. As you can see, uh, all the, the participants came from all over the country. We are a very small country, as you know. 
but sometimes it's not very very easy to travel uh, to um, from a, a place one place to another, especially if you are uh, away from the the, um, the coastline. So the the, mo the online model uh, has proven to be a good model for us, and is is um, and I think. It helped us to, to find participants all over the country able to participate in the training. Not concerned to the, the workshops, we stick to, to the program. So uh, we stick to the eight workshops, one trainer for uh, each work, workshop. But we changed the way that uh, the, 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 the workshops were held. So we have online sessions and we um, programmed the, the online sessions for two hours synchronous and three hours synchronous. So we, we realized that it's very difficult to have um, training for hours on an online uh, synchronous, it's very difficult. So we, um, we divide this way. So the, the, the hours the synchronous allows the participants to fulfill the tasks and do some, some, um, some projects that are left by the by the, the, the trains. Nevertheless, um, uh, uh, it's important to to um, to underline that we are using our own online training platform that makes makes it easier to do the online sessions. Um, but also to underline and to uh, take this experience to the next edition of the crafting business. Uh, the two hours synchronous has not been respected <laughs> because the, because most of the time uh, the, the the participants are quite enthusiastic and so um, the trainer um, has to prolong this 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 session so we are going to to think it over for the next edition the the division of, of the time we from the beginning we were very sad to lose uh, the richness of the communication and the bonding that happens in the in the in a in a in a room so we we try to 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 discover a way to keep all the bonding of the group because everyone is at home uh, the group never met um, each other all as a group only half and half. So we tried to, to, to create moments to um, communicate more and give the opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to create bounds between the groups. So we, we designed some uh, talks online. So they are talks, open talks aimed to the crafting business participants, but they are open to the public. All these um, talks are aligned with the, the workshop theme. The speakers are uh, entrepreneurs or, or experts, not the trainers from the workshops, different people. Uh, and we are planning to do six or eight uh, talks during this edition. The first one was very interesting. It was about uh, business resilience. We had a, a talk with a, an entrepreneur, not a, a crafts entrepreneur, but a, an entrepreneur with a very uh, vivid and interesting experience as, a, as an entrepreneur. And he shared his uh, resilience to the, to the, to the, to the challenges of, of the business. And for instance, today we are going to have a ceramist that is um, going to share um, our experience in, uh, in sales online. She's very experienced in that and she's going to, to share with our participants of the talk how she managed to, to do the sales through online and how this helped her to overcome the, the, the pandemic. Um, this is very briefly the point uh, where we are for the moment. Uh, we, we think the model is working. We haven't yet begun with the mentoring and consulting, the, the formal mentoring, because uh, there has been very mentoring, but not the formal mentoring. We haven't begun yet with the mentoring and consultancy. We are going to, to begin it uh, very briefly. Um, and we, um, 
we hope that the second edition will full will be like this 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 one with some slight um, adjustments to what we are implementing now. But um, the true actors of uh, of this play are the, the the trainers and the participants. So I leave the floor to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And we are going to Miguel. I stop sharing. Yes. Okay. Miguel, can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Are you hearing me? It's yes. okay with the sound? Yes. Okay, good morning to, to all. My name is Miguel Gonçalves. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm one of the tutors for the Theatres for CR. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to CEART, Crafting Europe, and all European partners for the invitation and the opportunity to learn and share our experience with all of you. As Anna Christina has mentioned, we have put an intense and practical sort of ideation or acceleration program for all the participants. It was challenging without a question, but one good challenge, and with participants like we have in Portugal, everything becomes easy. Uh, we have a group of 20 different ideas, 20 different backgrounds and stages. Some of the entrepreneurs are already working on the idea business for the last couple of years and other they have started recently. Then we have the challenge of the global pandemic. Almost all of the business, they need the fairs, the physical markets, the municipal and regional events to meet potential customers and to promote their personal brand. All of them, they have developed, of course, the digital marketing, but there are little bugs trying to have visibility in the big forests. Everyone is screaming in the social media. And if you do not have visibility, it will be difficult to sell. We could have the best products in the market, but if the market doesn't know that we exist, normally the game is over. But we found that now is the time to prepare for tomorrow. And tomorrow, without COVID, is just around the corner. So from our perspective in the entrepreneurship side, we are not teaching the entrepreneurs how to be better craftsmen. We are preparing them to be better entrepreneurs because all of them are terrific artists. So now we want to train them to achieve the sustainability as, as a business once the majority of them wants to make their projects in their professional life jobs. As I mentioned earlier, some of them are already working 100% focused on the idea. Some are working on a part-time basis and still a few are still on hobby, but they want to achieve the professional goal. So for us, one of the biggest issues is feasibility. How to turn all the ideas into sustainable projects. The revenue streams of the craft activity normally, they are not so regular as the aspiration of all the projects. So our goal, was to reunite a team of facilitators with a lot of business experience to coach, provoke, and challenge our entrepreneurs to think outside the box, uh, to think about their idea from a different perspective. It has been a hell of a journey, and we are very enthusiastic with all the work carried out until the moment. Our facilitators teams as professionals specialize in design thinking, in the MVP, meaning viable product development, branding, marketing, funding, business angels, but of course, we know that every project has different needs. They are unique and special, but we believe strongly in the experimental learning. So learning by doing is our motto. In our training model, the peer learning takes an important part of the learning process. During the secret sessions, it is almost impossible to make small exercises and they have all the time to listen all the participants. But they are so committed and engaged in the training process that we have created some extra sessions when it was possible to discuss all the ideas that they did not have the time in the official ses sessions and the attendance was over 90%. So from our perspective, again, entrepreneurship is not about what is right or wrong. Different facilitators, they have different backgrounds, expertise, and of course, all of us will pass our life and business experience to all of the entrepreneurs. One of the most interesting sessions was about the current digital tools that they were developing privately by the participants. And of course, all of them, they have developed according to their experience, personal tastes, etc. But we have shared our vision from the client's perspective. And the visions can be slightly different. What is granted and easy for the entrepreneur can be not so understandable for the clients. And, the, and we know that the customer experience should be as seamless as possible. It's complicated. 
easy to fall in love, choose and pay for the stuff or the products that we are buying. And we had some very interesting discussions with all the entrepreneurs about the insights, rational beliefs. But because in the end, entrepreneurship is all about doing and making decisions and learning with them. It is an attitude. And we are sure that as better we are working the entrepreneurial and business side of the artists, better we are preparing them to the future. But the stage has to be to the main actors, our entrepreneurs, our projects, our shining stars. And one of the, our brightest stars, Marta Bartles, will be speaking for her and for all the others that have been with Seart and our team in these fantastic European projects. Thank you for your orientation and I'm available to answer your questions here or later in the appropriate forum. Now the stage is yours, Marta. Hi, Marta, you are muted. Hi, uh, you should turn on your micro. So good morning, uh, are you listening? Yes. Okay, so I'm Marta, uh, thank you, Miguel. And so now I'm gonna share my screen to, to show a video about my work. I'm sorry, I think I did something wrong. That's no problem, Marta, just I think click on to the other one. Okay, so now I think now it's on. Amiga minha que me falou. Eu fui ver. O macramé surgiu, surgiu completamente por acaso, num jantar de amigas, uma amiga minha que me falou. Eu fui ver. Gostei. Achei que tinha imenso a ver comigo. Chamam-nos artistas, isso acaba por ser um, um elogio, claro, mas não sei, não sei até que ponto sou artista. Eu gosto de pensar em mim como uma artesã. A parte boa do meu trabalho é que eu posso trabalhar onde eu quiser. Isso, isso confere-nos um sentimento de muita liberdade. Com o macramé estou, estou mais perto de ser essa pessoa que eu realmente sou. A maior alegria para mim é o reconhecimento das outras pessoas do meu trabalho. Ou seja, quando eu faço uma peça e as pessoas dizem, Marta, era isto. Uh, okay, so here I am again. Thank you for seeing my work. I am a macrame artisan uh, from Portugal, and uh, now I'm gonna share again my present my PowerPoint presentation. So, uh, what I have to say is that I've been a full-time artisan for four years now. Uh, artisan, creative, manager, photographer, marketer, salesperson, courier, and whatever it takes to, to keep my business going. Um, if I could choose, of course, many of these roles I rather delegate. <laughs> In fact, um, so I'm sorry, the slide was, I wanted to share was this one. So in fact, uh, many artisans uh, starting out in business find themselves having to take on multiple roles in one person themselves, of course. Uh, my training for performing all these functions has basically been my life with uh, all the experiences it uh, has brought to me, my moral values, the research I do, and uh, the examples I follow. Uh, I've been doing well, however, with new ideas popping into my head and uh, gaining more and more, more client trust, I feel the desire and, uh, and also the need to leave an amateur path to embrace a more professional one. Um, at a time when topics such as sustainable consumption and art crafts are receiving attention, it is also very opportune to see projects like crafting business emerge, which bring the possibility of providing artisans with valuable skills to manage their business. 
This was the main reason I applied for the program, program and also the expectation of meeting an international network of artisans and business mentors, which whom I could uh, exchange contacts and make partnerships, expanding my business and helping to expand theirs. Um, I found in crafting business a very supportive team uh, with experienced professionals in various areas who are providing a structured and complete program to give us a more solid knowledge as entrepreneurs. And uh, I also like to point out the close environment in which the action is taking place, which allows students to have their doubts clarified case by case. So um, I would like to thank you for this opportunity that is given to me. And once again, highlight the relevance of initiatives like this one that contribute to the recognition, valorization and qualification of the handicraft sector, as well as the preservation and modernization of such modernization of such an important cultural heritage as the manual arts and crafts. Um, as our tutor Anna Cristina Mendes said in the first uh, in the first meeting, because craft activities are now uh, professions of the future, so it will be great to to meet you all in person. But I don't know, maybe next year. <laughs> Thank you for listening to me, and uh, back to you again. Thank you. And uh, our next next in our program is uh, the questions and answer session. But before I give the floor to Shona, I want to ask uh, of, uh, all our participants to stay tuned, stay with us, because after the session, we will have a very interesting and inspiring video from our headliner, Laura Matthews. So stay tuned. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, yes, yeah, so if all of the speakers or panelists, if they want to turn their, their, their screens on, you're more than welcome to do so. I think we have some general questions, first of all, that are coming in. So I'll do my best to answer those. Uh, so first of all, a lot of people are just asking again about the recording um, of today's session and of course yesterday mornings and where that can be found. So we are aiming to have both recordings up on the website and on our social media by tomorrow or Thursday at the latest. And you can find those on Facebook, which is at Crafting Europe, and our website, which is www.craftingeurope.com. So it's just there at the bottom of the screen. So um, please do go in and have a look. And if you missed any of the speakers, we've also asked for all of our uh, pre presenters to send us their slides and presentations. And we will make a blog post on the website and include all of those there as a resource for everyone. So hopefully everyone is able to go back in and review those. Um, a question again that we're getting, and this was coming up yesterday too, is about the second phase or the second open calls for all of the um, crafting business programs. Uh, we have the first question is for Portugal. So Anna Cristina, I know that you're only currently halfway through the first phase of crafting business, but one participant wants to know when. Can you hear us, Anna Christine? Oh, yes, I can hear the question. Please, could you repeat it? Of course. Yes. So you're only the first way. Shona? Um, yes. Can you hear me? Okay. I lost. I lost the sounds. I. I can't hear you. That's okay. I'll repeat the question. Can um. It's it's just I don't know if you can hear me now, Christina. Yes. Now. Yes. Can you repeat it now, please? Yes. So um, just one question from a participant was, and, and we are aware that obviously in CRT you're only halfway through the first program for crafting business, but one participant would like to know when the second phase will happen for Portugal? We haven't, we haven't have um, a date for the open call, but we want to catch with time and we intend to try and begin in even in the first semester, if possible, at the latest, latest in September, September, at the latest. That's great. And for anyone that is interested, obviously, and is coming to us from Portugal, as I said, all of that, all of the open calls will be on our website for Crafting Europe. Yeah. We have an opportunity section there. So um, every open call for each partner country, that will be included. Uh, Marion in the Netherlands, do you have uh, any dates for the second one that you can share? 
Uh, yes, I, I uh, showed it in the presentation. We started uh, the 1st of September and it will last to the 1st of December. Brilliant. Um, I know, and again, I, I know you, you've shared this in the presentation. It's just a few people are just asking again for the dates. Uh, so in Georgia, if you could share yours for phase two. So we are going to make an open call from the springtime sometime in April, May. And uh, then uh, we want to finalize the second edition also by the summertime. So this is what our plans are. Great. Um, mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Uh, and then finally in Italy. I'm not sure if Elisa, if you can hear us or Costanza, if you're able to jump in. Hi Shona, I'm here, but I cannot uh, switch on uh, the video. That's no problem. Um, we can hear you anyway. I, I'll make you co-host if you want to put on your screen now. But if you could let us know about the dates for phase two. Sorry, I don't uh, heard the, the question. So we're just wondering about the second open call for crafting business in Italy. Yeah, uh, we are thinking uh, to launch the new open call. Uh, in the month of March, end of March, uh, beginning of April. Brilliant. No, sorry, 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 not November, November, October, November. October, November. So obviously. yes, crafting business. I sorry, I was thinking to I at I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, October, November. That's no problem, Elisa. And, and Elisa just mentioned there the I Atelier program. So that's um, the program we mentioned at the very beginning where we're integrating digital technologies. And hopefully um, a lot of the participants will be able to participate in Fab Labs in different partner countries. Yeah. So for Ireland, for example, uh, we have, they just had their open call for that. Uh, the deadline finished last week. And uh, so the, the participants will be starting shortly. And while some partner countries, um, the situation is different for each. So some will be launching an open call very shortly for iAtelier. So again, please keep an eye on the website and you can see about that. So if you're interested in joining that program too. Um, another question we have is looking about the countries yesterday. So when is Ireland's second program coming up? Uh, again, the dates haven't been officially announced, but the open call will be added to the website. So keep an eye out for that. And again, follow us on social media because we will always post that up in terms of Instagram and Facebook when the deadlines are approaching. And another question we have is, do we think the program will be extended to other European countries? So obviously at the moment it's happening in eight partner countries. And um, this is a very much a pilot program that we have running as part of the Crafting Europe project. We would love to see other countries uh, take it on. And we have obviously developed this from the Hothouse program developed by Crafts Council UK. Uh, for us at the moment, our funding is just for the the eight partner countries and we'll have two phases of that a lot of learning and knowledge and you know expertise will hopefully come out of that for us but we will be sharing all of our learnings and all the resources from these different programs on our website and hopefully they do prove an inspiration for other countries and maybe they'll start adopting them in the future so i'm not sure if there's any other questions i've missed I, I just want to add that uh, in Ukraine, the crafting business uh, two uh, second part will be uh, in September, October. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's great. So, so another person is asking, do you think it's possible to have an event with different craftspeople from different countries somewhere in Europe? Believe me, I'm sure all the partner <laughs> the project partners here would absolutely love to meet in person and have an event all together um, again, especially physically, but at the moment we're just so aware that that's not possible. Um, but you know, even as part of the project, we do have some events and for us, a final event is due to take place uh, during Dutch Design Week in 2022. We really hope that will happen and that we'll all be able to meet in person and that hopefully some participants of the projects would be able to come and join us as well. So um, we're, keeping our fingers crossed and we're obviously working, doing our best that we can all meet in person soon. 
I don't see if there's any other questions. Let me know if anyone, if it's coming into the chat or Q&A, if there's anything else I'm missing. Yeah, there is uh, a question in uh, the chat. Thanks, Costanza. I'll just have a quick look at that now. So one question is, how did the various European partners adapt the program to their own national situations? For example, British craft market is very different than most other European countries. And that's actually a really good question because as we mentioned yesterday, the crafting business program was developed from the Hothouse program, which was created by Crafts Council UK. So they're just really asking how did, I, and again, this is probably open to everyone on the floor, is there anyone that really had to tweak or, or change and adapt the program to their own craftspeople or to their own situation? I don't know if there's anyone that wants to come in on that. I can speak for Italian side. Uh, of course, the markets and the situation of craft are really different between our countries. And for example, in Italy, we adapt that uh, thinking about carefully for the needs of our craftsmanship uh, and our craftspeople. So I think uh, it's the sector itself that led this uh, event and uh, this crafting business series to adapt to, to different countries. So it's so flexible and, and very interesting. We, we had the big response from all over the Italy because of the COVID, because we, we went online. So I think uh, that is important to start um, a discourse like this. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I can say about Ukraine also that uh, we make it possible because of uh, our Handicraft Chamber of Ukraine and the uh, business school. Um, that helps us to adapt it to for uh, needs of our craftsmen and uh, uh, work with uh, with uh, great trainers and also make uh, um, guest speakers that give their uh, great experience and some inspirational speeches also. Thanks, Elizabeth. That's great. And I can also add uh, in regards to Georgia that, uh, again, with support of um, USA, the economic security program, we added some uh, extra courses like, for example, uh, um, uh, intellectual property rights for craftspeople. That was very, very important. Also, we made the internships, special internships uh, for the craftspeople. So, and some other activities of marketing, uh, it, it didn't happen this year because of pandemic, but uh, for the next year, uh, our um, beneficiaries will also participate in Ethnofest, uh, the one uh, that will be organized, hopefully will be organized in the um, uh, fall time. So yes, we really adapted uh, the all, but, but what is important, the main line and main um, uh, like uh, strength of this uh, whatever was adopted to our conditions was uh, this hot house uh, uh, structure. So and but again, yes, we did it uh, in regards to Georgia. Thanks, Mac. Yeah, no, I do think that that is something like the core values of the hot house program was carried yeah. through um, in every single country. And it was about professionalizing craftspeople and opening up new channels to them. And while some um, partners may have focused on, on different topics slightly differently, um, I think you're very right there, Maka, that the main you know, core vision and strength and values of the program was always carried through. Um, so thanks for that. If there's anyone else that wants to um, ask any questions, please do. Uh, and someone else just asking about the slides. So yeah, we're going to actually create a blog post on the Crafting Europe website. Um, so you can, we'll, we'll add in all the speaker slides and um, one person in particular, I know Marion uh, Beltman has, uh, was unable to stay on for the call, but they're interested in Marion's slide as well. So uh, what I will remind again, all the speakers and thank you so much to everyone who has presented today. Um, do email on your slides to me afterwards and we'll, we'll add those to the website so that the public can go in and view those and download them as well. Thanks everyone. Um, so Caroline, yeah, you have a question as well. Uh, are you able to? 
to share your screen? Uh, well, I, I, yeah, I'll just uh, sort of appear, I suppose. Um, my, my question was to Rasmus um, earlier, he was talking about the Creative Business Network um, and obviously working across Europe, across the world, and wondering whether the effects of Brexit have uh, actually affected the way um, they're able to work. I think Rasmus actually, I, I think he may have not been able to, to stay on. Um, okay. So he, he was able to go, but we, we can definitely pass that on to him. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I know we're going to go on to Laura shortly. So um, Laura, if you want to get yourself ready and I've got the video there to, to play on your behalf as well. Um, just want to check if there's any other questions here. I think it's just lots of really lovely comments. So if the speakers would like to look at those, we'll say our thank yous and a few other words um, after Laura. Um, so I think that's all the questions for now. If there's anything else that someone would like to ask, we can again go back to this just after Laura's quick presentation. So um, I think we'll now just pass it over to, to Laura. Are you there? Hello. Yes, I am. Hi, Laura. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, oh, it's would, been amazing. Would you prefer for me to show the video first or would you like to speak or? Um, yeah, if you just show the video, my internet is quite unstable. So um, that just makes sense if you do it. <laughs> problem um hopefully is everyone able to see it or let me see sorry um is everyone able to see that okay yeah i can yes, see yes. it yeah great let me see my is it playing for me now hello my name is laura matthews i'm an artist puppet maker based in nottingham in the uk I focus really closely on recreating biological mechanics to create really realistic movements in my sculptures and puppets. Over the last just couple of years, really, I have gained quite a strong Instagram following of, it's just under 40,000 at the moment. It's quite a shock sometimes to think that there are that many people who are interested in my work and who've seen what I do and follow along with the journey. It's grown really organically really genuinely i've never paid for followers i've never done those share for share exclusively to get more followers my followers are engaged i get quite a lot of comments quite a lot of likes and messages and it does bring me a lot of happiness it really does it's a great way to connect with people and it has also brought me a fairly reliable source of income as well but it definitely didn't start out like that I joined in 2014 because I just got my first iPhone and I felt very cool and I thought I should join Instagram and it would be a good way to share my work. But it started off more as a visual blog and haphazard, not necessarily well thought out. My first post was my friend's dog <laughs> leaping into a grass verge, which is completely irrelevant, but it's a really cute picture and I still have it up. It was bad photography, bad lighting. I was averaging about 20 or 30 likes per post. I wasn't entirely sure what hashtags were and I was using ones like articulated, which made sense to me, but it brought up a lot of images of trucks and buses. <laughs> but something I've always tried to do right from the early days is respond to comments and respond to messages because my work's using laser cutting I get questions about that I get questions about how I work out the joints and at the time it was just to be polite and because it really I was flattered that someone would take the time to write out a message and ask me about my work later on I found out that that's actually really good for your Instagram um, algorithm, Instagram app for as long as possible, rightly or wrongly. But if you can keep someone engaged and interested, then your post is rewarded by being bumped up the timeline and you get more exposure and more reach and your post will therefore do better. So it didn't really grow at all for the first couple of years. In 2016, it was 30 to 50, something like that, likes per post and I had maybe 500 followers. My Instagram was pointing to my Etsy shop, so I was selling through Etsy. And I'd get the odd sale, the odd commission, but my studio was in no way paying for itself. 
and year on year I was making a loss. I was working quite a few jobs. I was and and I started getting pretty bored of my work. I wasn't really innovating or developing or making any big leaps or progress really. It was quite sad and I came so close to handing in my keys to my studio, giving up, getting a proper job in an office, feeling like I'm not good enough to be a full-time artist. I was working part-time in a gallery as an invigilator and the exhibition that sparked everything <laughs> was um, this Dinosaurs of China, which was talking a lot about the evolution of dinosaurs into birds. It reignited this spark of being truly interested in how animals work. And I've always loved puppets. I had loads of puppets as a child, but it never really occurred to me that I could make my own. And because I was just sort of bored with the flat layers of my work, I thought, I'm going to try and make a puppet. I have the very early videos of little beginnings of bones just sort of loosely tied together and starting to think how these could work, how these could move and become a bird. I think we're a bit like cats. We like things that move. And so the videos would get quite a lot more followers each time. I think people responded really well to the fact that this sparrow puppet was a story. It was evolving in two stages where I got the wings working and then the feathers on and then the legs working and then the whole thing moving as closely to a bird as I could get it. And for the first time ever, I carved some of the pieces, starting off with the sparrow's head because I couldn't find a way to make it really work in the flat layers that I was used to working with. So I started carving some of my other work so the hairs that had sold in flat layers, when they were carved, they were a lot more popular. People could see there was a lot more work gone into them. They had a lot more personality and a lot more character. Therefore, because there was more work gone into them, I could ask a higher price for them. So I had the passion for my work again, and it was starting to get really exciting thinking what I could make but I didn't really have any of the knowledge of how to hone this into a success. A couple of people at the studios that I work from have been doing this Real Creative Futures business course as part of the Big House, which is an East Midlands initiative designed to help small creative businesses. As part of the programme, there was some free business mentoring and I turned up flustered and not really sure but determined and passionate about what I was doing and I was encouraged to apply for the hothouse program with the crafts council and I got in we did a really great photography course which really helped me start thinking about my images and therefore my Instagram posts and I started to think about my colour palette and more consistently use this big blue-grey tile that I have. started using that as a regular background to improve the overall look of my feed, as well as understanding more about lighting and storytelling with my work as well. And I would also try to post fewer workshop images or at least move the glue out of the way first and just try and stage it a bit better and make it look kind of messy but chic rather than just messy <laughs> and my Instagram continued to grow and the project that really took off was my dragon puppet in the same way that people loved the story of the sparrow being made and developing and coming together people really loved the dragon developing and coming together and getting more and more personality and more and more functional movement. People really responded to the videos and the better photography. And in February 2019, I hit 10,000 followers, which felt like a huge number. And it would be quite exciting to go to bed and wake up in the morning with another 100 followers. And shortly after that, I think I cautiously launched my Patreon. 
which gave me a very small but a predictable monthly income, which was something that I've never had with my artwork before. And it also gave me another outlet to show some more in-depth work and have a bit more of a closer relationship with people who were interested enough to give me a monthly subscription. I stopped selling my work on Etsy, learning more about marketing through Hot House and you know placement in the market. It really showed me that I needed to be curating my own space on my own website and get away from the sort of Etsy look with a lot of mass produced items are on there masquerading as handmade. And my work just doesn't fit within that Etsy marketplace. Having my own website, my own space gave me the confidence to raise my own prices and selling for more money gave me more confidence. It became a kind of snowball effect that actually, hey, this could really work. So all my fluffy, excited, delicate little threads of, I love making stuff and I'm really excited about this, that all got knitted together with this really strong core of knowledge that Hot House gave me and became a metaphorical tapestry that I could take forwards into the future as my business. And I applied for Arts Council funding to focus on developing a body of work for a show that I was doing in York. And I got it. It meant I could quit my part-time job and spend all of my time in the studio. And it was amazing. I had a really good exhibition. Other things in the pipeline. I was meant to be flying to Germany for a puppet festival. A big London show was still really, really exciting. And then a global pandemic hit. And everything I was excited about was all cancelled. And it was like someone clipped my wings just as I jumped off a cliff and I plummeted. And I lived on my sofa and I played The Sims and I drank too much and I couldn't look at my work. And on top of that was this massive uncertainty about the future and my friends and family and how the world was going to be. And then one morning I woke up and I'd accidentally left my game running at triple speed and my sim was old and nearly dead. And that was the sign <laughs> that I needed. And I quit the game and started thinking about how I could rebuild my life and pull myself up. So pre-COVID, my patron higher tiers, they would receive um, like little parts of projects that I was working on. So I was working on a barn owl and they'd get feathers and little mechanisms but because I had no projects I was working on I didn't really have a focus so I asked my patrons what they'd like me to make and the answer came back a shark please and so I started working on a shark which felt like a really big challenge because of the um, horizontal movement a lot of my work has vertical movement and I'm used to thinking in vertical planes but this horizontal movement was just enough of a challenge to really get my teeth back into it gave me something to post about and talk about on Instagram. And in turn, that got me more patrons who wanted sharks for themselves. I developed more kits initially just for the patrons. And then I sold a few just via Instagram on my website. And when my work was just in flat layers, I've been asked a few times, oh, could you make a kit version of this? And I'd always gone, mm, no, maybe in future, because there was quite a lot of illustrations and instructions to do for the assembly and so I'd always put it off but now I didn't have anything else on the horizon so kit seemed like a perfect idea people weren't necessarily interested in buying big high value pieces but a lot of people were wanting kits that they could make with children that would arrive in the post that were something to keep people occupied and I applied for the COVID relief fund from Arts Council England. And I think because I had shown that my business could be viable, I got it and I could buy more materials and I made more kits and people really loved them and I had money coming in again. I was only really able to make 10, 20 at a time because I was cutting them in my studio on my own laser cutter and it, was, it takes quite a long time to make each one. But that meant they stayed quite exclusive, which meant they sold out quite quickly. And that gives me quite a big cash injection in one go. And it also meant I retained control of the quality. 
there are some lines which need to be engraved to a specific depth in the wood. Some of the holes have to be countersunk. And it really worried me, the idea that I'd outsource them, they'd come back wrong, I'd have wasted loads of money, or I'd have to redo loads of parts myself. And it just felt like that was too much hassle. And also, the kits aren't my main focus. They're a means to an end. They've served a really great purpose. And I, I've got a few more in, in the works that I'm thinking of. But being able to sell a bunch of them, that then gives me the time to work on my bigger projects, which is where my passion really lies. Having the finance training from Hothouse means I've got the greater ability to plan the next few months and gave me time to work on my Velociraptor puppet, which people absolutely loved on Instagram. I had some really fun videos that I did that people responded really well to. I'm working currently on a blue bar now, and that has a story of how that's coming together. I'm on 39.2 thousand followers, and I get about five to 10,000 likes per post. Video watches, it can be sort of 10 to 50,000, depending on the video. And then comments can vary from 20 to 150 around then. But I still really try to answer them all. And I do keep half an eye on the Instagram algorithm developments. I try not to be too worried about it. I think it's good to have a bit of an understanding of how it works and how it promotes some content and demotes others. So recently they downgraded likes and comments and upgraded saves. So I've just slightly tailored my posts to be something people might want to save. So slightly more educational, maybe slow motion, things that they might want to look back on afterwards. But I try not to think about it too much. It's just in the back of my head. And I've looked at more appropriate hashtags. I use hashtag wooden animals. And I use maybe four or five relevant ones per post, but I don't use like artists on Instagram or anything like that. I feel like there's probably so many people using it and art's such a broad spectrum. And so your work could get lost using generic hashtags like that. I haven't ever paid to promote any of my posts. I'm considering it for my latest bar now just to see how much of a difference I can make and how many more people I can reach. I'm a little bit suspicious, thinking that maybe if I pay, that will then choke my reach on subsequent posts and try to keep me paying, even though I'm sure that's what Instagram wants me to do. I've also never done any um, paid promotions with brands. As soon as I hit around 15, 20,000, I started getting emails from influencer brands. But a lot of it is, you know, bracelets or things that are completely irrelevant to my work. and. I've never been tempted by it. Even when it's offering money for it, it feels like it would be a betrayal to the people who've come to my page to see my work. So I just try and stay really genuine. For a while, I thought that maybe I should try and appear more professional and more polished and like more of a corporate image, thinking that that slick business appearance would in turn make me more of a slick business. But it turns out that people respond to people I've embraced the fact that I am a one-woman band and that my story is personal. It's me in my studio and I make things. I feel that gives me a good way to make mistakes as well. If I miss a message, I can say, oh, I'm really sorry, I've been really busy. And a big corporate company wouldn't be able to get away with that. There have been times when I've been performing with the Sparrow or the Dragon Puppet and people have come up and said, oh, who's helped you with that then? And so I add in a couple of pictures of me sometimes if I'm making something. I'm a person, here I am. This is my work that I do myself. And I think people do like to see the face and the person behind what they make. I think social media gets a really bad rap and it definitely has its dark points. But I found a really amazing community of other makers across the world that there, there's no other way that I would have come into contact with them. And having these lovely enthusiastic followers who ask questions and I get to pass on my knowledge that I've earned over the years 
and hopefully inspire them to experiment and to make mistakes because the journey of making these things is just as rewarding as the final product. So while I definitely appreciate my following and the things that it brings to my work, my main focus has to be and always will be what I actually create and how I develop that into the future. And thanks very much for watching. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you for the amazing video and for your beautiful works. Uh, I, I'm sure that the uh, participants of the event all over the world uh, were inspired by your video. So thank you again. And dear participants, before I give the stage again to Shona, I want to say a few words. Our today workshop has finally come to an end and I wish to express my thanks to all participating countries and thanks to everyone engaged in the preparation of this seminar. It was quite a dive and also a wonderful trip across Europe. We believe that our project partners, tutors, artisans are now inspired of, by the experience of their colleagues. And I want to say thank you to our great interpreters with, which provided an uh, opportunity to deep engagement of our Ukrainian participants. We were so happy to see such a huge number of participants. Thank you of all of you and each of you. Now the last time for today, I give a floor to Shona. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. Um, and a huge thank you, Laura, for that video. Really inspirational, as Elizabeth said, but also very honest. I wondered, um, I think we might have a few questions for Laura. So Laura, if you're able to unmute yourself, that would be great. Um, and maybe Laura, you know, you probably come in and be listening to some of the presentations today. If there's anything else you wanted to add on top of your video, first of all, in case there's any points you wanted to give or any other tips to everyone else, because I'm sure you know, you really outlined your whole journey that you've gone through and particularly in, in uh, spite of, of COVID-19, it's really inspirational. So maybe there's something else you want to add? Um, I think what I found, like genuinely, it sounds really cheesy, but Hot House actually changed my life. And for anyone who's considering, oh, I don't know whether I want to go through with applying, to, to get this professional help, just absolutely just go for it because these people know what they're talking about and to get so much information, it makes it possible. I think as makers, we always have these sort of like little hopes and dreams, but you know, generally we're told that, oh, not many people can, can be an artist. It's not a, like a viable career option, but with the information, it becomes it, it turns it into a possibility and just go for it. Just do it. it it exists and to, to make these things possible and thanks for having me <laughs> well um we've one question for you laura and um, so much as because well, you did go into that about the social media algorithms and a few people are just asking about you know where where how to start and you know it, that's quite difficult for them to know where to start and and how did maybe you got into it so maybe with your own research how you started that um, with the algorithms, there's there's loads of information about Instagram um, online. Just if you just Google Instagram algorithm updates, it can give you um, so the latest thing. So I just I just checked it on the off chance about a month ago to find out that they'd um, upgraded this bookmarking thing. And just having that knowledge, I don't, I don't try and think about it too consciously, but subconsciously just knowing that, hey, if I make it something that someone will save, that'll maybe you know just give me a bit more reach and a, and a bit higher so i try not to be too um too corporate about it and like i need this much reach and i need this many likes but just just to be aware of it to kind of play the game a bit i suppose <laughs> No, that's great. Um, and it's amazing. All the comments are coming in, just saying how honest and identifiable it is listening to your story. Oh, thank you. <laughs> really, it is really lovely to hear. And um, I really love, you know, you really went through all the highs and lows of it. And I think 
all makers and craftspeople have gone through those exact same highs and lows, especially over the last year. So to see that you're you're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, that you're you know how much of success you've made out of it over the last few months is fantastic. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story. Um, I'll see there's there's kind of comments coming still coming in. I'll keep an eye on that in case there's any specific questions for you, Laura. Um, but if all the speakers want to put their screens back on, um, we will just finish up by saying a few thank yous. Um, first of all, a huge thank you to our hosts today, the Handicraft Chamber of Ukraine, and to Elizabeth and Marina for all their hard work over the last few weeks. I wouldn't even say days, weeks of hard work in getting um, today together for everyone. So well done to you. Um, a huge thank you as well to all our project partners um, and to everyone who has presented both this morning and yesterday. A lot of work was put into the presentations and the slides and you know for, for getting all the speakers together. So well done to everyone on that. And it's been wonderful to hear everyone's story and their journey and to hear how, you know, how the crafting business program has or the Hot House program has worked for them. Um, a special thank you to our communications partner, Artex, in particular, Costanza Matarasi, for all her work on social media. She has been absolutely fantastic um, in, in really getting our audience numbers up. We were delighted to be joined by over 500 over the last two mornings, which is a fantastic number. Um, and, oh, I think the recording, there we go. Um, also to say well done to all of our translators um, who've been on board the last two mornings too. They've been very busy and hopefully it means that any participants or attendees joining us in Ukraine were able to listen to, to all of the speeches and um, you know that they could to get some takeaways from that too. Uh, Elizabeth, is there anything else I'm missing if you'd like to jump in on? Almost great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, well, thank you for, for all that you've done for this event because you know that it was big work for all of us. Thank you. God, oh, thanks. Well done again to everyone. I think we're going to leave it there, as I said. Um, if you have any questions or you're interested in the open call, please follow us on Crafting Europe and come, go into our website. Um, but I think we'll leave it there. Everyone. Again, thanks again to all our speakers and, of course, to all our audience for, for coming and joining us the two mornings. So thanks all. We'll see you soon.